Welcome to Chiro Author Insights. I am very, very excited to have an innovator in the chiropractic profession sharing an insight into subluxation today and an incredible book, The Thermodynamic Subluxation, The Intersection of Chiropractic and Ecology. Dr. Peter Fox, you know, I'm going to give you a little bit of background before we get into the book, of course. At the age of six, he experienced recurrent ear infections, uh, which progressively got worse and required antibiotics. His mum took him to see the chiropractor and he recovered from his ear infections in a much shorter period of time compared to what um, would be taken, what would happen if he was only taking the antibiotics. We love these success, success stories in chiropractic and the impact that chiropractic has and how it motivates people to on a chiropractic trajectory. He continued to receive chiropractic care for various reasons after that, but his favorite reason to get chiropractic was to enhance his athletic performance in bicycle racing. Dr. Fox has found that continued chiropractic care has allowed him to develop new athletic skills in a variety of sports and live his best life. As I said, he went on to become a chiropractor. Yes. And graduated with high honors from Palmer College of Chiropractic in 2008. He later served as an assistant instructor in the Palmer College of Chiropractic Technic Department and as a supervising doctor for the Chiropractic College students on a chiropractic mission trip to, to Brazil in 2013. That is some passion for the profession. And as I said, he's the author of this incredible innovative book, The Thermodynamic Subluxation, The Intersection of Chiropractic and Ecology. Dr. Fox, welcome. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. And the first thing I want to do is I just, you know, I want you to give it just a little bit of background about the book. I mean, I, you know, as a chiropractor, we know, understand, love the principle of subluxation, the, the, the impact that has on the profession. And you've brought a new angle to subluxation by talking about these thermodynamic elements of it and actually even bring the quantum realm into this book. So I'd love for you just to give a description of, of what the book is, what the book is about, and the role of thermodynamics in subluxation. Got it. So the, the reason I wrote the book is that I was reading the D.D. Palmer's last book, the tiny little one, the one that got published after he died. And, and I'm reading the introduction to it and I'm hearing him describe this sub science of chiropractic. And in it, he starts talking about this, this old science called bionomics, which later ended up becoming ecology. And um, I'd, I'd always looked back to nature as sort of like my, my source for truth. Whenever I had a question about something, I could, I could look to the science about the natural world and it could give you a, a very good objective answer um, as opposed to you know, hearing different spins on this or that. And so I thought to myself, well, um, I've been doing all this research into different healing traditions around the world and the, the the basic premises behind the types of work that they do. And I ended up coming across a lot of research about the way that energy moves through the body in regards to the autonomic nervous system to the thermodynamics of that as it relates to, to the second law of thermodynamics in particular. And it just all meshed together so well, the, the way that our bodies work to move energy through them and how that interaction between our internal environment, external environment relative to the spine. And I just, I just had to write a, a book about it. And so, and so I did. Beautiful. And so summarize the thesis of the thermodynamic subluxation. I mean, you spoke about the energy, how it moves in and through the body, but encapsulate for the chiropractor who may not have done the same level of research that you have, or has even gone through a college that is not familiar with the principle of subluxation and then to, to, to expand that into this thermodynamic realm. So let's, let's talk a little bit deeper about the thesis of the book. Okay, so the, really it all revolves around the second law of thermodynamics, which is the, this law that uh, systems tend towards entropy or chaos disorder over time, that they don't spontaneously emerge into order. And there's a, there's a sort of paradox with that where you know, we see things decaying over time, but yet at the same time, we see new life being born. We see ecological systems increasing their levels of complexity over time. And this was a, this was a question that all the great physicists in the 1940s and 50s were kind of like trying to figure out. And what they realized was that when you have a thermodynamic system, if it's an open system, if energy is able to enter it and leave out, out of it, what that system will tend to do is it will tend to create 
structures that will maximally utilize the energy gradients that they're presented with. So to simplify it on planet Earth, we have the energy gradient of the sun, it comes down, you can split that light into a prism, it's very highly ordered, it's very high in its energy. So living things bring that in. And those living things, what they do is they take in massive quantities of, of the solar energy, and then they degrade it into infrared radiation, and they do it incredibly inefficiently. So we're talking about a loss of about 90% per trophic level. And when I was a kid growing up in high school, I thought like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would, why would we lose 90% of the energy? But that's, that's, that's the debt that we pay to the universe in order to exist in an ordered form. We have to export more entropy than, uh, than we produce. So it's, it's a matter of balancing that equation from uh, energy in, energy out. And we get to spend a brief amount of time violating the second law of thermodynamics doing that job that's 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 how that works and so uh, in human beings it's the it's the autonomic nervous system that regulates that function and because the autonomic nervous system has such a integral relationship with the the postural muscles and with the spine it ends up creating the possibility for order and chaos within the spine as well so that's that's talking about it at the more like mythic esoteric level, but at the bare bones of it, we get muscular imbalances, and those muscular imbalances are due to a dominance of external focus as opposed to a parasympathetic driven internal focus. And when that mismatch happens, things break down, things go wrong, and that's where the subluxation comes into it. Mm. And so in the many paradigms that most chiropractors are familiar with or aware of that there's a neurological impact of subluxation, a biomechanical impact of subluxation with the new strain response and research foundation model, they also add coherence, um, adaptability and its influence on well-being. How does that interact or relate to the thermodynamic element? So the, the thermodynamic element is that the, the central nervous system is our, it's our regulator of thermodynamic energy flows. And so we're always balancing our internal reserves relative to the external demands of our environment. So if you take, you take, say I go into a stressful situation, all of a sudden my body has an outside focus. It's having to put more energy, more focus, more brain power towards the outside world in order to deal and adapt with that which means that I'm running at a slight deficit on the inside. So we would talk about that as interoception versus exteroception. So interoception is this, this internal focus of, of energy and resources, and it helps to maintain order. It helps us to digest. It helps us to balance out our postural muscles, which are, which are very metabolically expensive. And when we encounter a situation where that, that's overwhelmed, where we need more energy, more information than, than we have, then we shift to that external focus and things start to go wrong on the inside. We start to shift energy and information processing away from those fine posture control movement towards more gross primitive movement strategies. And then that results in spinal dysfunction. Um, but it will also result in a long-term um, autonomic dysfunction as well. And then restoration, again, whether we talk on any of those levels, neurological, biomechanical, or otherwise, and energy information flowing in, removal of any interference allows for the ability of that body to, to restore its, its harmonious state of well-being, operate at a higher level or greater level of functional capacity. And that means that they're, they're operating at the full, the full level of potential that is inherent within every, within everyone. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. We're at, the way I see the chiropractic adjustment is that it works at the very finest detail level to restore interoception while also correcting the dysfunctions that occurred while the body was dominant in that, in that outside focus. It helps us come inwards and fix what's gone wrong so that we can restore ourselves and rebuild our reserves. And ideally, if we do that at a, at a regular interval over time, we'll build our resilience so that we're able to face more and more in life. As we get challenged, the chiropractic adjustments help us to focus back inwards, rebuild, and come back stronger. Kind of like if you were to go to the gym and you, you exercise your muscles and they get damaged, but that exercise is done in a smart, intelligent way. 
we give the body rest time and it's able to recover and come back stronger again. And that's, that's, that's what I see as like the best gift of chiropractic is that it's able to help us become more resilient and coherent over time. I love that. And interesting, you, you spoke there about resilience and one of the best gifts that it provides. In, in your book, you also talk about the impact on uh, evolving the human potential, maybe even elevating humankind and a possibility of even linking in my interpretation to consciousness and expanding expanding the human mind and capacity. How does it, I, I want to raise that because that, as a chiropractor, I love the yeah. idea that we're not working with back pain, neck pain, headache, we're changing the course of humanity. I'd love for you to talk and touch on that in this context as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, on the on the surface, that sounds like a really like grand and uh, improbable statement, but it, it comes down to some really simple things, which is that when we're stuck in a sympathetic driven, stress oriented, exteroceptive mode, then we're operating at lower brain level functions. So, for example, um, they've done research in public health where they're looking at the environment that people find themselves in and the likelihood that they'll make good choices based upon the amount of stress and the choices that they encounter. And there's this argument right now in science about whether humans have free will or not. And predominantly the, the consensus is that we don't actually have free will. There's some debate about that. I kind of fall on the, we have some free will side. And, and the way that I see it is that when we're able to interrupt that stress pattern, we're able to get ourselves out of that that amygdala driven fight or flight, then we're able to have better access to those, those conscious levels in the more modern evolved parts of the brain. And as we're in that place, then we have the ability to uh, influence and control from the top down. So um, this is why I believe like people who've meditated over the years that are able to use their conscious part of their brain to influence the way that the subconscious part is programmed. So um, this is how people are able to, you know, better deal with like anger management issues with anxiety, with, um, reprogramming themselves so that their PTSD isn't as severe as it used to be. We're using the conscious brain to subtly influence and reprogram what's happening at that subconscious level. And I believe that the chiropractic adjustment, you know, we, we know for, for certain that it has influences on those conscious parts of the brain that it seems to activate them more. Um, of course, it's theoretical that it helps us to do that top down control, but it makes logical sense that that would be the case. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about the background of the book as well, because I, I, this is, I think, a fascinating uh, framework from which a book has come. So, uh, you know, to, to lead into that process, this was an idea you had that you felt might be um, a journal, journal article that's ended up as a book. So I'd love to just talk about that story a little bit so that we get a, you know, constant, a context for how a book can be written. Yeah, so, um, so originally this... Uh, I had written a larger book, which was called The Operating System Nature of the Birth of the Tradition. And it was just my way of answering my own questions that I had about chiropractic and its place within the larger role of healing systems throughout human history, you know, both ancient history up, up to modern times. And so as I was reading about all those different things, I mean, it was like an extremely, I, 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 I can't believe that I had the amount of time available to do it. It's one of those things, like I look back on it and all of the things had to fall into place for me to have the amount of time necessary to come up with that book. There's no way I could write it right now, but I'm really grateful I had the time. And the, the thermodynamic subluxation concept came out of the research that I did to write that book. And originally I was like, okay, let's get this published as a journal article. Um, and then that seemed like an overwhelming task. So instead I decided, well, I've got this bigger book that I'm going to publish. Let's have a let's have an experiment in publishing and let's publish this thermodynamic subluxation uh, article in, in book form that people could like readily digest. I made it the same dimensions as Didi's most, you know, his last book, um, just, just for fun. And um, people, people have really liked it and it's gotten, it's gotten some traction. It's, it's, and it's, it's been a really good experience and I, I really find it to be some of the clearest and most succinct writing that I've done. And um, I think it's actually a better book than the larger book. And that's how these things go sometime. And uh, in the long run, I did end up getting it published in a more uh, in-depth and advanced form in um, Journal of Philosophy Principles and Practice of Chiropractic, 
June 11th, 2020. So it did, it did find its way into print. So it, it was, a, it was a good adventure. That's fantastic. So coming back to that process, like you said, there's this succinctness of it, the, the, the quality of your writing. What, what was your, how did you, how did you translate research to, to readable print? So what was your mechanism being able to do that? Ooh. I got lucky. <laughs> Honestly, I got lucky. <laughs> I think what happened was, was that I had written, you know, like several hundred thousand words for, for this other book and that skill set had grown and grown. And, you know, I probably could rewrite that larger book in much better format now. So I had the benefit of having gone through that whole process of, of writing, you know, a several hundred page book right before doing that small one. So I, I think it was just practice, practice writing you know, hours, hours of writing every day. I probably wrote about two hours a day for a good, a good five years. And then the two years before that was a lot of reading, a tremendous amount of reading across a huge number of subjects. Um, Cause I didn't, I didn't really look to just the chiropractic research. I went out and I looked at ecological journals. I looked at mathematics journals. It was like all over the, all over the board. Um, my mind works in a very integrative way and it just, I'm, I'm one of those people who I'll see, I'll read the journal article and then I look for the little like numbers and I say, okay, that's really interesting. Where did they get that idea from? And then I'll go and I'll look at the reference and then I'll read that paper. And then it'll go down this rabbit hole of this paper, this paper, this paper. And, and pretty soon you have this really good understanding of a lot of these different complex subjects and I think that's the best way to to read research and to learn about any subject is to really look at the footnotes and um, and follow up on the on the source material that people use to to compile to come up with their ideas and that's that's to me the best way to really learn a subject. I love that. And what was your? I mean, what, obviously you enjoyed the research. You you have a, a desire to learn and to to be able to expand your your paradigm. What was your motivation though, not only for the learning part, but I'd like the insight in that as well, uh, to then to write, well, why, why take the learning, put it into written form? What, what motivated you to, to want to, to get the message out there? You, you know, a lot of it is just a, um, you, you see that something's true and that it doesn't yet exist in a format that other people can access and, and you, have to, you, have to, you have to do it. Um, kind of the, <laughs> there's a really funny story about how I actually got into practicing network chiropractic. And it's uh, that I was, I was writing this book and I was doing the research. And one of the things that I read was, I read a lot of stuff about theosophy and anthroposophy at the time. You know, this was a good seven years ago. And then I started to read some of, um, some of the older green books written by Didi. And I just had this, like this, this thing click that I was like, oh, this chiropractic had its origins in a lot of this theosophy and anthroposophy and spiritualist traditions and things like that. And I'm like, man, somebody's got to write a book about that. And so, you know, I, I spend about two or three days doing some research in it here and there. And it's not too long before I come across uh, Simon, Simon Senzan's book, you know, this, I think it's the secret history of chiropractic. So I went and at the time I was living in Davenport. So I went to the Palmer library, got that book out, read it. And I was like, this is perfect. I don't have to write this book. So I, I got a hold of Simon. I said, Simon, thank you so much for writing this book because I've got this other project that I want to do, but this book was so important and I'm glad that you wrote it so I don't have to. And uh, he's like, well, oh, that's great. Like, what project are you working on? And so I told him about it. He's like, wow. He's like, your ideas are really similar to the, this Donnie Epstein guy. You should go learn network. And so, you know, I ended up looking into network and it was a long series of events that transpired over seven years to for me becoming a network practitioner but that was that was the original thing that brought network into my awareness and uh, and, and led to that that road and you know that's that's kind of how things have gone for me is having a curiosity in something and just following it to its end point and then realizing that there's a message there that has to be shared and and fulfilling yeah. on that element which which leads me really to my last question here which is the impact you, you said that the book has got some traction uh, obviously that's a really important for you as an author also for the message that you have what type of uh, you know experience are you having now having this book out there in the in the marketplace for chiropractors 
um, even for people outside of the chiropractic profession, it's other scientists who might um, read this and, and put it into a new context. What type of results are you seeing as a result of publishing this, publishing it, the article that it has become, and the, the impact it's having on you, your career, and the message that you are obviously wanting to share? Uh, the favorite thing that that it, that's happened is more chiropractors have become aware of the the links between chiropractic and ecology so that it's it places chiropractic within a much much larger framework you know it's not like this separate island of science that's on its own and and doesn't have these links to the the larger sciences as a whole so i think it's been really encouraging for me to see that yes in fact there are very valid basic science principles that go all the way down to the level of the atomic structure that hold chiropractic truths within them and that chiropractic fits in that larger realm and that chiropractic has a role in bettering the human organism the the human society and culture and community as a whole so that we can better perform that task you know um ultimately every single organism its task is to be as thermodynamically efficient and to be able to transform as much energy as possible and you can't do that if you're sick you can't do that if you're subluxated you can't do that if you're dead and the chiropractic adjustment helps to fine-tune that energetic structure and the idea that i can come to the table with that concept in my mind that i'm helping to fine-tune the energetic coherence and transformation capacity within the person on the table just being able to hold that in my consciousness as i'm doing the adjustment has not only changed the outcomes but it's changed the way that i see the person when i'm working at them on the table so um, and i hope it's done that for other people too that's wonderful and unfortunately you prompted another question which i really feel needs now to be asked for those people who are doing this research who are looking and and have their own um, journey that they're on, what would you say to them about diving into the research and drawing out our, finding the uniqueness of that message individually for them and then sharing that so that we can collectively grow our consciousness as a profession? What, what would your message to somebody who has knowledge, wants the knowledge and wants the research to share the message, how to go about doing that? How to go about doing that? Uh, well, to go about sharing this message, um, the Roman, uh, dig into the book, but more important than digging into the book, at the end of the book, there's all the journal articles that I read to come up with that book. Read all of them. Um, they're, they're almost all available for free. And you know, even if you find some way to just find those, those, those references, just go read those. And if you read those and you put that in your consciousness, thinking about how it relates to chiropractic, it will transform the way that you see chiropractic and human beings as a whole in the way that you practice. And that allows us to, again, as chiropractors, express ourselves fully and completely, change the lives of the people coming to our office and therefore alter the experience of those people for chiropractic. Peter, I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. I'm excited. I, I had a great reading. I've got all these wonderful notes all through here. I know that we're going to have another conversation at a later time as you present on this topic. So Everyone join in on the Subluxation Summit where we get to speak to Dr. Peter to go deep dive into that event, grab the book and you know, continue to evolve your understanding of chiropractic, its principles and its impact on humanity. Thank you, Dr. Peter. Appreciate you and your time. Oh, very well. Welcome. Thank you.